Now let's look at the construction features of displacement diffusers. Most displacement diffusers have a few parts in common. They all include a rear plenum assembly and a face plate that's perforated with either round or rectangular holes. While some manufacturers simply provide perforated baffles or splash plates inside their products, other manufacturers choose to include a central baffle fitted with adjustable air pattern controllers. Diffusers with adjustable air pattern controllers typically ship out in a default position that provides a standard radial air pattern. In order to allow easy access for field adjustment, the face plates must be removable. Although diffusers with this feature are designed to be adjustable, it's still advisable to make product selections based on the standard radial pattern. At this point, you may begin to wonder why adjustable diffusers are recommended at all. Well, the answer is easy. Adjustable diffusers are recommended because of the adjacent zone. It's important to provide some means of fine-tuning the air pattern. As anyone in the construction industry knows, things don't always work out perfectly and sometimes spaces change purpose. For these reasons, adjustable diffusers are recommended to accommodate changes in room layout or seating locations. In this example, we show how several seating locations around the conference table would likely fall into the adjacent zone of a standard radial pattern diffuser. Then we show how adjustable pattern controllers could be set to kick the air along the walls and away from the occupants. With non-adjustable diffusers, it would be completely up to the designer to select a product that would avoid any comfort issues and there would be no flexibility for future needs. When I think of displacement ventilation, I'm thinking big spaces because these are absolutely the best applications. Any spaces with room heights greater than 9 feet and enough open floor space to allow the proper air pattern to develop should be ideal. If the space will be occupied by moving people like visitors to a museum or travelers walking to a departure gate, that's also ideal because the adjacent zone shouldn't be an issue. In a restaurant or casino that may permit smoking, the air quality in the breathing zone could be significantly improved by displacement ventilation. Classrooms would also benefit from the improved air quality and low noise operation of a displacement system. Now let's look at the places where we wouldn't recommend using displacement. Since displacement works best in large open spaces, confined spaces with low ceilings don't allow us to take advantage of stratification. These spaces are best handled with mixed air systems. If the heat loads are greater than 30 BTUs per hour per square foot, then we would likely create a drafty environment if we tried to use displacement. In situations where contaminants are heavier than air, displacement would also be a poor choice. This could include indoor swimming facilities where chloramine can be a problem. In a chemical laboratory, displacement could result in spilled chemical agents being brought up from the floor to the breathing level. And last but not least, displacement ventilation should not be used in conjunction with mixed air products to serve the same space. Mixed air products would likely prevent stratification from forming correctly in the room. Now let's look at a design procedure for displacement. First we must determine the total cooling load. Then we need to look at our floor space and check to see if the total cooling load doesn't exceed 30 BTUs per hour per square foot. If that checks out, then we can proceed. Next we must calculate the cooling volume that we'll need to handle the actual heat loads in the occupied zone. This calculation is of course based on ASHRAE Research Project 949. Now we go into ASHRAE 62.1 territory because we need to look at our ventilation requirements. First we calculate the minimum fresh air requirement for the breathing zone and then we apply an air change effectiveness factor of 1.2 for displacement. I should warn you that even though ASHRAE says that a reduction in fresh air can be made due to the form of ventilation being applied, this reduction may not be recognized by all code enforcement authorities. Now that we know our fresh air requirement, we can determine the supply air volume for our diffusers. As we would expect, this will be equal to our cooling volume. If we're not supplying our diffusers from a dedicated outdoor air system, we can use our fresh air requirement to determine the percent of outdoor air that we'll need to have at our air handler. Next, we can calculate the supply air temperature that we'll need to meet our room temperature set point. Once we know our supply air temperature, we can easily calculate our exhaust air temperature. Now finally it's time to make our diffuser selections. 
I went through this design procedure mainly to reinforce and apply the theory that we covered earlier. Most engineers that I know don't have the time to go through an exercise like this. For this very reason, most manufacturers offer product selection software to simplify the process and save valuable time. Our selection software is posted on our website and available for free download. It provides several different strategies for making selections based on known parameters. If you know the heat loads in the space, our program can perform the RP949 calculations to determine the heat loads in the occupied zone along with the recommended supply temperature and air volume. It also checks to make sure that the heat loads are not beyond the recommended limits. It is truly a selection tool. You can specify the minimum or maximum number of outlets and whether they'll be located on walls or out in the space. It then recommends the products and sizes that will meet your requirements and ranks them according to the size of the comfort zone they create. We consider the comfort zone to be the floor space outside the adjacent zone of the diffuser or diffusers. While standard default terminal velocity of the adjacent zone is 50 feet per minute in our program, it can be set to whatever value meets your requirements. The program also maps out the adjacent zone and allows the diffusers to be moved around the room. Now back to the diffusers. In order to keep discharge velocities low, displacement diffusers tend to be large. Unlike overhead diffusers that drop into ceiling systems, displacement diffusers are typically located on low side walls. As you can imagine, this means that the architect and interior designer should be involved from the start in order to integrate these products into the design. Luckily, displacement diffusers come in a wide variety of sizes and styles. Matching duct covers and optional mounting bases are also available to provide a clean installation. Now let's look at what's available. This is a rectangular flush model designed to fit inside a wall. These are available in a variety of standard depths and face sizes. As you can see, this unit creates a one-way air pattern. This unit is also rectangular but designed for either flush or floor mounting. It should be said that all of these diffusers can be supplied from either above or below because it makes no difference to the air pattern or performance. This unit also provides a one-way air pattern. The next unit is similar to the previous unit, but it includes discharge openings on the side to create a three-way air pattern. This next unit also provides a three-way air pattern, but it has a curved or bow-fronted face. This look seems to be most acceptable to architects and interior designers. This unit is quite different from all the rest. It's designed to go into auditoriums and concert halls to deliver displacement ventilation from a stair riser. Another way to condition these spaces is to use small round swirl diffusers to deliver low velocity air from below the seating. I've always liked the look of this one. It provides a 360 degree circular air pattern and is most often used to create air columns in large open spaces. This model is similar to the last one but it provides a 180 degree air pattern. There are many creative ways to integrate a unit like this into a column or the end of a wall. And here's another variation on that theme with deeper sides to create a three-way air pattern. Now we're going to look at units that are designed to fit into corners. This model has a curved face that creates a two-way air pattern. This corner model at first looks a little austere, but would probably look best in a flush-mounted installation. Oddly enough, even though the unit has a flat face, it actually provides a two-way air pattern. I said earlier that displacement ventilation is only suitable for cooling, but promise to show you an interesting way to deal with heating requirements. Traditionally, displacement ventilation has required the use of separate perimeter heat to deal with loads resulting from exterior walls and perimeter glass. This often means the use of thin tubular products, separate ducting of hot air, radiant panels, or under window fan coil units. Well, here's an interesting solution that you might want to consider. This is a relatively new product design. We call it a dual chamber displacement diffuser. It was originally developed by Titus for a school district in Southern California. They wanted the advantages of displacement ventilation for their classrooms, but they didn't want to use a separate system to handle their mild heating requirements. This diffuser is built with a rear plenum that can supply air through either a large displacement panel for cooling or redirect the air through a lower grill section for heating. 
The reduced size of the lower grill increases the discharge velocity to get the horizontal projection needed for heating. The internal diverting damper can be activated by a small electric actuator, but we're also working on a self-powered energy harvesting model that will be completely standalone and require no power or external control signal for activation. Now let's look at the dual chamber diffuser in operation. So we've covered the theory and application of displacement ventilation. I'm sure that some of you will no doubt have a few questions 